the nation and the world. So before I begin, I just want to kind of gauge uh, your interest and your domain because this presentation is not me talking all the great things what we do. It is mainly to understand and work collectively to define what tech <clears throat> and is this better that side? Yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> By the way, that's Jing. She is uh, my team member and she does all of her social media marketing. And so all she does is make me look good. So that's why she's here. <laughs> and yeah, so as I was saying, it's more about understanding what you guys need and what are the challenges you have in your organization or in your group. So maybe by raise of hands, can you tell me who is in healthcare? So three, um, finance. No. Okay, so what are the other industries which are being represented here? Kind marketing of marketing tech. Marketing and tech. Okay, that's cool. So that gives like health and marketing and tech. So that's awesome because the entire presentation is aligned to uh, focus on all the three uh, needs. So a little bit about me. I'm a uh, I'm Neil and I own a company called Epifinder here in Scottsdale, Arizona. We started three years ago with a simple objective to really define how the health is uh, being done and performed on the patient. And by our exhaustive search and understanding, we found out that there is a complex need when it comes to epilepsy. 40% of the patient goes undiagnosed or misdiagnosed because there are 62 different types. And so more often than not, uh, the, the patient just stays in the healthcare ecosystem for 12 to 18 years, and that costs the U.S. healthcare system $36.8 billion each year. There are 65 million people worldwide, and one in 26 will have epilepsy. So that means we are, we are about 26 people. So one of us will have epilepsy at any point in our lifetime. So it's a massive, massive problem. It's not talked about, just like cancer or diabetes or cardiology, just because there is a lot of stigma associated with it. That being said, we'll just jump right into it. We all live, eat, and breathe technology, and we all crave for something which is cool and sexy all day, every day, be it an app on our phone or be it a digital product for us to use and play with, all the way from Amazon Echo uh, to an app on your phone. We are always like embedded into the ecosystem. And now, just with our last year report in 2018, more time was spent on our digital screen compared to face-to-face -face interaction. So 2018 was a year where our entire human-to-human -human communication shifted from in-person communication or a <laughs> chambers meeting like this to actually communicating through our digital devices. So guess what? If you really want to be on the cutting edge, if you, if you are providing a solution or if you are providing a service or if you have a product, you have to you know, welcome tech even if you like it or not. And so what happens is that there is all the advances in different fields, all the way from Uber, Lyft, uh, healthcare, even in marketing, more tech is being used, right? Uh, days are gone where you market to like audiences like this. Now you're thinking about digital marketing. You are thinking about social media, you are thinking about influencers. The days of like billboard advertising is almost gone unless you have a billion dollar budget and you can still keep doing it and waste money. So that leads to something what we call adoption. So you know the Gen Zs and millennials are pretty good at adopting tech compared to, pardon me here, but that's the fact. Uh, compared to baby boomers and elder millennials. So if I'm working on a marketing agency or a social media company, and if I'm, I'm targeting someone who is in the 60s or 70s to adopt and use my product, what's the best way to go about it? So commonly we think about, okay, let's build an app or let's just push it out on all of our platforms and hopefully it will click. And, and the spraying and playing approach is gone. Uh, no, no longer, no one wants to hear from you if uh, you are not providing what's in it for them compared to what you want to serve or what you want to get paid for. So the challenge what happens is, let's say you build a great product and you, you walk into an organization who would need it, 
But what happens? They said, we are bombarded with different solutions. We don't want your solution unless it's significantly different. So there it comes the adoption, you know, how you can overcome the adoption in this institutional age. And that leads to what we call institutional inertia. That means organizations don't want to change or move unless there is, um, you know, a carrot. That means there is financial incentive. A uh, stick, that means there is a penalty. And that is, a, that is dominant in healthcare. When you talk about healthcare, doctors will not change how they communicate and how they see patients unless there's a new policy. But again, it aligns with what the policies and advocacies what we talk about here is that if there is not a significant policy in place, the doctors will keep seeing the patient the way it is. The patient will keep doing what they are supposed to do or what they are doing it unless you have a penalty or you have an incentive to do it. And as it happened in healthcare, we are seeing constantly in other industries as well to drive innovation, to drive adoption, because we don't lack, uh, we don't lack technology. Tech is everywhere. What is the challenge for us is how to really find the meaningful information or meaningful product what we want to use into our day-to-day -day organization and actually finally being able to use it 100%. By a show of raise of hands, if you're using a product or a service in your organization, do you think you are using 100% of everything what they have to offer? No. The reason why is because even if you're paying full price to pay and to use for it, what happens is you just use what you need. And so how can we create a solution in the marketplace so that way we adapt to the needs of our stakeholders. We can adapt to the needs of our customers. So, and that's only possible if we can overcome institutional inertia. So the change must come from the top. So I'll just give you a case study uh, with my own company. Uh, we have two products. One is for the doctors, one is for the patient. And the one which is for the doctor is a screening tool. So essentially it helps doctors triage the patient whether or not they have epilepsy. And second, if they have epilepsy, what to do next. So guess what? As an entrepreneur, fresh off the board, fresh off the school, we decided let's make the best tech out in, on the planet. Right? We did it. Guess what? If it is not, if it doesn't fit with the workflow of a doctor who is seeing that patient, even if it is a game-changing tech, they will not use it. And that's what happened. We went out, we got the pushback, and we realized why it's taking place. And so then we understand what's required, and we built it. And we decided, okay, let's do a clinical study at Mayo Clinic. You know, Once it's proven at Mayo, everyone will use it. We did it. Mayo Clinic study was completed, and we were like, okay, starting tomorrow, in our bank account, it will be kitchen, kitchen, kitchen. Nothing happened. Again, you have to understand why they would use it. So, just by with our experiences, we have constantly seen that even if you have the best team, if you have the best product, that doesn't mean that you will have the drivers which will lead to adoption. And again, that comes back to how we can overcome institutional inertia, how we can create incentives or penalties in our organization so that way we are focusing on not what's in it for us but what's in it for them. So I'll see this same thing over and over again because I've seen that a lot of people with the digital marketing push with the new tech, everyone is thinking that, okay, if we create funnels, if we create marketing, if we create paid ads on social media, we will get customers believe it or not, and it doesn't happen, and businesses fail. Um, you know, you don't get adoption in, uh, with respect to what you were targeting. So that is like really challenging. And so here, when leaders encourage innovation and risk taking, innovation happens, magic happens. And so coming to the next point of your policy, which is the digital wellness, where now mainly we have all the things what we use in the day-to-day -day basis, just like Apple Health, all the way to Fitbit, all the way to, you know, different sensors, biomarkers in our day-to-day -day life. They all go through the same thing, which is 
how you can bring something which is new and different into the day-to-day -day life of individual people. I'll take a pause here and see if I'm able to resonate with you, what I'm saying with you guys. Is it yeah, near? Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. So that's where you know. So my challenge or my kind of the concept for you guys would be to go back to your organization, to your team, and see together what what can be done to really make a difference when you're bringing or pushing your new tech, new product, new device out in the marketplace. And again, the same thing came about when we started launching our next product, which was for the patient population, where we thought, okay, let's build a product so that the patient who have seizures, who have epilepsy can effectively use our application. And we call it self-management behavioral tool. And we lo loaded it with features and you know new incentives and everything. Guess what? We had to take a lot of things out of it because we realized if it is too complicated, if it is too cumbersome, people will not use it. And that's why you know anytime we think about something in terms of the design or in terms of ease of use, we always think of Apple because it's very simple for the customers, but it is very complex for the engineers. And that's the same thing which we have to replicate when, you know, whatever we are doing into our day-to-day -day objectives. The next thing is talking about government's role and policy. Even if you like the policies, even if you like the government or not, believe it, that it will impact your business. It will impact the products or the, your stakeholders when you are talking with them. And so they came up with the new regulations recently with respect to FDA, with respect to International Standards Organization, and with respect to the tech and manufacturing. And FDA is one of the stringent law which is out there for med tech companies like ours, for healthcare, uh, whoever is in healthcare over here to really keep an eye out because they are changing the laws and regulations quickly, pretty quickly. And then finally, about the Digital Health Innovation Plan. So if any of you are in digital health, that's the, this is uh, the slide for you guys that how FDAs um, brought about the new pre-certification program to produce your tech device in the marketplace in 90 days or less. So that's the new thing which is in the marketplace. And then all of this wouldn't be possible without the community support. So this is all of our partners, our clients, recognitions, and that's pretty much about it. I'll open it for Q&A. Questions? What role does HIPAA play in, in that? Or is that just a completely di different and separate regulatory uh, agency? So that's a good question. HIPAA plays a big role in terms of whenever you're touching a patient or collecting the patient information. And so, uh, for example, at Epifunder, we use HIPAA compliant cloud server, 256-bit encryption, we have a chief compliance officer on our team to make sure that all the data uh, is in alignment and we are using the data to provide effective outcomes for the patient. The data is not misused for anything else. You know, we have the privacy policy, uh, TNCs, things like that. Um, and then, of course, the moment your company uh, keeps growing, uh, guess what, who will start no knocking your doors? The policy agents. Uh, the compliance officer and say, hey, you know, you have like 20 hospitals, what are you doing? Let, let us see your data flow, the information flow, where are you uh, keeping your medical records if it is physical, right? Um, everything for us is digital and uh, we work at an office where we have to make sure everything is secured, lock and key model. So uh, documentation, so we have a internal team member who his entire focus is to write policies, to write protocols and to write um, processes. So anytime we have a new update in, in with respect to our app, so we have to, let's say if we go from version 3.1.1 to version 3.1.2, we have to document everything what we did and why we did. So it, it cannot be just like, oh, I'm a founder of a company, I wanted to add this new feature, it, it looks cool. No, it doesn't work that way. It has to be the feedback from the doctors, it has to be a feedback from hospital executives, 
for us to take it, translate it, and put it into the our application version. Yes. Daniel, um, so a little bit about competition and moving into a space where there might be some existing incumbents. Can you talk a little about your perspective on the process of educating the customer on the ROI of switching? I don't know if there was a lot of competition in the space that address the same solution that you're solving, but usually there's other things that do it probably not as well. So educating the customer on the fact that the switch is going to be worth it, the switching costs. Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, for us, the incumbent is not the another competitor's product because what we are doing is a very different and innovative, but every doctor is so used to using the same methods or the same uh, processes which we have and it's been the same system for the last 27 years there was not significant innovation so the first thing the way we can convince or you guys can convince is to create a case study that why your product is different than your um, other uh, products in the marketplace so for us it's the very old kind of big heavy bulky EEGs which are being put on the patients and it costs the hospital system over $10,000 to have one EEG in a room. It costs them the space of the hospital system also. So what we did is we calculated all the costs they are incurring and the efficacy of that EEG is 60%. So for 60% of the patient population, it will predict correct procedure or epilepsy. And so when we did with EpiFinder, product it's a digital product so we don't need space so that's number one benefit to, to your customer number two we are at 87 percent accuracy that means we improve the accuracy for patient screening by 27 percent than the current standards the current methods so that's clinical efficiency and then the third thing is financial effi efficiency that means the eeg and everything costs them over 10k plus whereas this is a product which is less than $100 per patient per use. So now you can see how dynamic of a difference there is. And then getting customer testimonials. So we have testimonials from the chief of epilepsy from Mayo Clinic, right on our front page of our website. So that way anyone who asks, hey, you know, why I should use you or why we should, you know, change and switch and go through all this crazy process of training, educating, overcoming skepticism, for our employees, well, I just said go to my website and see what this doctor is saying. Yes? I work at Park University, and in higher ed, a lot of times we find that when we want to implement new technology with our faculty, it's usually the students that help drive that. And in talking to some people they, in conversation about healthcare, sometimes people are unaware that they find something, they go to their doctor, and that drives innovation. So do you find that true here? Is that, are the patients helping drive it? Or do you think it has to be driven from the, from the um, top down? So that's a great question. And uh, at first we thought about when we were building the patient tool and the reason why we started making the patient tool apart from a doctor tool is because all the patients uh, started knocking the doors and saying, what's in it for us? Again, the same question what I mentioned. Is that, and we decided we don't want to venture into the patient space because there's already other free apps which are out there. Uh, our focus is the diagnostic engine and we want to expand to from epilepsy to other conditions. So what we realize is that you can directly go to your consumers. That means a lot of ed tech companies which are here in the Valley, I'm connected with a lot of founders as well. They approach students and the stu students will tell the faculty. In healthcare case, that's not actually true because doctors are responsible of doing no harm. They take the Hippocratic oath. So even if the patient says like five times to them that, hey, I found out about this or I did this, can you look into it? Guess what, doctors have to see like 20 patients a day. All they're focused on is clicking, documenting, signing off the notes and going home to spend time with the kids. So they're, unless they are the chief innovation officer at a hospital system, they are incentivized based on the new adoption of technology, not by how many patients they are seeing. So you have to talk to the right person who has the authority to make change. So in healthcare, the way we have, I mean, I learned this over the last 12 months is there are three different targets. 
from the from me selling to them one is the decision maker second one is influencer and the third one is recommender so recommender can be the patient who are recommending doctor hey you know look into that influencer is someone who will influence the decision making process of the person who has the final authority to say yes or no so the influencers in the healthcare industry is mainly chief medical officer chief informatics officer chief finance officer because they are the people who are kind of looking into what's next and then finally the ceo of a hospital is okay he signs the a document and say okay we have a contract with epifinder so not we have to target all three of them and sometimes the recommenders are also the physicians so we meet all these physicians at conferences so rather than us marketing on facebook because we know less than 80% of the doctors are not on facebook trying to see what's next out there but they go to conferences so what we do is we build case studies we present at conferences we have a exhibit on the exhibit floor we have a booth and then we bring doctors at our booth and say okay this is what we are doing this is game changing this is innovative would you like to try it for 30 days for free and then they say okay sounds good and then what we do is just like any other apps we start for free and then once we are so hooked into it we become the monthly paying customer and that's what we are doing so do you, do you have a early detection or is it something you know once some some incident happens right now it's one once an incident happens it's more reactive <coughs> uh, because once you start collecting the reactive data you can move towards predictive because in healthcare the moment you give a false positive and if it happens more than 10% of the time they kick your tech or the product out of the healthcare system because they don't have time to waste so we wanted to be very rational and logical on how we approach in the marketplace but soon uh, we are uh, we just partnered with a local another eeg company who has a portable headsets and then they have the ability to predict so what we are doing is we have a um, a robust algorithm and a diagnostic platform and we are integrating with the data sensors to bring that to more um, predictive and at home care so uh, what what made you cho choose this uh, segment did you did you have personal experiences and that's a great question so my uh, co-founder and business partner he went to medical school got sick in rush uh, chicago was bedridden for 2 years all doctors prescribed him was steroids and that was not he, what he wanted to take so he he figured out his own way and at that time what he started doing is started putting all the clinical symptoms like with him being the patient zero put together and then the framework when it was built and designed is applicable to over 287 conditions as of now and then when we presented this as a case study at Arizona State University because he, he was pursuing PhD and I was pursuing my masters and that's how we got connected uh we presented to a group like just like you folks uh with doctors from across the valley with different hospitals with different specialties and everyone said you have to focus on epilepsy because that's where the need is the greatest and that's where you can really identify from 62 different types of epilepsies to the top 3 most likely for that particular patient and so we saw okay that's the need uh and again it's not what we want to build it's what the community has the most need and then they will pay for it so that's how we launch into epilepsy but now we are so connected with the epilepsy patient groups epilepsy foundations that we have a patient advisory board where, where there are seven patients from different states which meets once a month to really see okay what next we have to do for epi funded product to drive into get adoption in the community yes uh, for the uh, you mentioned the patient tool that in the beginning was very complex and you guys had to simplify in what ways did you simplify and kind of how did you decide what you were going to simplify to yes so again it it boils down to you know everyone has like a lot of ideas every day and with 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 the patient tool we realized okay that there are over 18 different things which we would like to have on our app and then so we started with 10 of those things and again the patient advisory board uh, as uh, which i mentioned just briefly uh, we we took it to them uh, we invited patients for like customer focused interviews at our office and we also did some remote interviews for the patient who are out of state 
and then we ask them, okay, if you have to choose between this, what are the three things or what are the four things which you will choose? And then based on the consistency theme of what they would like to have or what they think, okay, this is most needed, we started with this. So uh, the three things which we are focused on right now is seizure management, uh, the treatment management, and then the lifestyle management. Really cool, really innovative, and I really appreciate the question you asked about how you got here from your other founder. Um, really interesting. At what point did you guys say we're going to focus on you know epilepsy first and then branch out? What was the defining moment for you to pick that? Sure. So the defining moment was a meeting like this where we presented our proof of concept idea, no app. It was just a PowerPoint presentation, just an idea in the brain to a group of doctors and two of the doctors, one from Phoenix Children's Hospital and one from Mayo Clinic said, we want to work with you and we are confident that whatever algorithm you have on the back end, we can translate it and have it available for our epilepsy patient community. That was the uh, moment where we decided, okay, we are jumping in. Yeah, I think having a really pure customer advisory or target uh, and listening to them, that is key. We, we also start, you know, we're a software network automation company, and we had all our thoughts about all we thought were network problems. And what, what people wanted was something much more simpler, and which was their primary problem. You know, and 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 it, it was it was hard to convince certain people because they. They were stuck on what they wanted to do, but we, we, we did make the choice, and that's the, you know, sort of a moment where you, you either make it or break it because if you just go down your path, we just created something everybody else has, mm -hmm. you know, and um, and that's very significant to listen and change. And and just to add on to that, that's a very valid point. Uh, we get requests from cardiologists, uh, from uh, different uh, specialty doctors. Hey, you guys did it for epilepsy. Can you do it for us? Can you do it for back? Can you do it for spine? So all we say is yes, coming uh, coming in the pipeline, and uh, you know, the moment we start venturing into other conditions, we'll bring those folks on our advisory board, uh, give them stock options, and now they have the not only the clinical interest but a financial interest to drive the product for the long haul. What's the next step for you? What's the next piece of innovation from here after you know epilepsy? Do you have another target in, in mind? Sure, yes, so epilepsy is one of the most complex comorbid conditions. And so if, if a patient is epileptic, uh, due to social stigma, they are not out and about, um, you know, because they are always afraid that they will seize and they will fall on the ground or fall on the floor. And so what happens is they suffer from other comorbid conditions such as a depression, social isolation, anxiety, and also they are prone to have other neurological conditions like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS. So that's our like the periphery conditions which the patients are presenting symptoms or the diagnosis of, and so we are looking into that. And we have started on one condition, but I'm not allowed to say at the moment. But yes, it's in that paradigm. Yeah, it's super smart to involve. So things that are directly connected to what we're solution yes. you provide yes. and the, instead of pivoting to something completely different. Yeah, because if we uh, move to completely different and build something and if it <coughs> fails, uh, in healthcare you only get one shot out of the door. If you do it well, uh, everyone loves you. If you do it bad, uh, you have to close your shop. So, uh, it, Unlike gaming, where uh, I always bring gaming and I know a lot of gamers hate me because I always bring that uh, in my talk is you know, when, you, when you design a game, you can always launch it with version 0.1 uh, to 100 customers, and then you can come to a version 1.0 and add more features to the game and everything. And it's okay, you know, we see the updates on Facebook, Instagram, it's always changing and it's fine, but in healthcare, if, the, if your tool or the tech doesn't work or if it takes the patient from this to this way, if doctor makes a mistake, it's okay. But if a product makes a mistake, it's done. Thank you. Any other questions cool. for Neil? Thank you so much. Sure.